Today's video is brought to you by the Modern Gun School. This is not the other place that you've heard online that is cool with taking your entire GI Bill and running with it. This is an accredited online university. Whether you just want to learn a few things or you want to break into a career in the firearms industry, check them out at Modern Gun School and let's hop into the video. Hey everyone, welcome back to the channel. Thanks for tuning in. It's great to be here as always. You're watching the VSO Gun Channel, and today I want to talk about the Iranian strikes. Um, real quick preface, I'm not really into the military stuff. I'm more of a commercial small arms guy. I have done some of the military small arms, but as far as the heavy stuff, uh, it's just not really my bag. Military doctrine, not really my thing. Uh, it's, it's just, I'm just not even, even remotely interested in it for the most part. Uh, however... What I wanted to speak on today was some of the nuance of the numbers that have been, have been thrown around dealing with the uranium enrichment. Many of you who have watched the channel for a long period of time will know that I was a chemist in a previous life, and I've actually held uh, one position at one point in time that was in support of a CBRN group. So I have more than just a passing knowledge of the uh, the process of uranium enrichment, what various thresholds mean, how it's done, uh, at least more than your average Joe out there. So I thought I would kind of like do that. But before we get there, I wanted to also say that um, we're not going to really get into the legalities of whether this is a uh, cool or not. I mean, the way that it's supposed to work is Congress is supposed to declare war and then the president has full capabilities but there the patriot act is also a thing so if the people in congress really want to bitch whine moan and complain about something they should do something about the patriot act and they continuously keep reauthorizing it so whatever the heck now as far as the military operation is concerned i watched this the press conference this morning i'll basically quickly go over we've launched a feint in an actual strike group that was uh, B-2 stealth bombers supported by 4th and 5th generation fighters. The 4th and 5th generation fighters uh, swooped in ahead of the strike package, took out all of the surface-to-air missile capabilities, and then the uh, flights of B-2 bombers dropped a total of 14 GBU-57s, which are the massive ordnance penetrator, the, uh, the bunker buster bombs. They're about a 30,000-pound bomb with a 5,000-pound warhead that's designed to burrow deep and hit any of those uh, subterranean uh, targets. We're the only people who got them and have the delivery mechanism to be able to, to get them there. Um, those bombers took off from Missouri, <laughs> and while they were in flight approaching the strike area, there were approximately 30 Tomahawk cruise missiles that were launched into theater at one of the nuclear sites. Uh, the B-2s took out two of the nuclear sites, and as they were exiting the theater to slam the door shut on them, all those Tomahawk cruise missiles uh, landed and took out third site. So basically, hey, we were here, by the way, <laughs> and that's the operation in a, in a nutshell. There's obviously a crap load of stuff that was moving as part of that whole thing, but it was a... Whole thing from first kinetic contact to exit of Iranian airspace, 20 minutes. There were no shots fired towards our folks. They did not even know that they were there, basically. So there's that. Now, as far as the thresholds of the, the enrichment, to understand how this works, basically you have to sort of understand uranium. And uranium, when you just have uranium, is about 0.7% uranium-235, which is the fissile component of uranium. The rest of it, the 99.3%, is uranium-238. And while it is part of the nuclear fuel, it is considerably less interesting. It's considerably more stable. You need to up the quantity of U-235 in order to get it to really do anything of a real note. Depleted uranium, for instance, is almost all 238. So in order to use 
uranium as a nuclear fuel, you must raise that threshold to, depending on the technology that you're using, as far as your reactor and all that sort of stuff is concerned, anywhere between three and 5%. So you must enrich the uranium in order for it to be viable nuclear fuel. It must occur. However, when you're talking about weapons-grade uranium, those numbers are more like the 90% number. So you have to vastly increase the uh, amount of 235 versus 238 in that substrate. That's an expensive process. Even to do it for nuclear fuel is expensive. Even raising it to 3 to 5% is an endeavor. And it's been done a couple different ways. The way that we made the, uh, the fissile material for the Manhattan Project was a gaseous diffusion process, uh, which basically means they put some Teflon sheets in it. And you got to remember that U-235 and U-238 are chemically identical. They do all the same stuff, so you have to sort them by weight. And we're talking about a very small percentage of the weight. It's further complicated because when you do this separation process, you can't just do it on the ore. You have to convert it to a gas. To do that, they react it with fluorine, which by itself is some really nasty shit. And the target species for that is UF6 or uranium hexafluoride. That's the same thing that is used in both the gas diffusion process and what is used today is a whole bunch of centrifuges. And these are large cylinders that spin really fast. And the concept is the heavier stuff moves towards the outside. The not so heavy stuff stays towards the center. And you basically siphon those off. So the stuff in the center gets siphoned off. It goes into the next centrifuge and then continues to spin. That's the center portion gets siphoned off, goes to the next centrifuge. And there's a series of these centrifuges that at the very end generates your enriched uranium, your enriched UF6. Now, what I just said does not do it justice because that sounds pretty simple. I mean, a lot of us have seen a centrifuge before, like a tabletop centrifuge. But I assure you that (laughs) doing that without creating a poisonous cloud of UF6 all over the place is not a trivial matter. So it's not a, it is a relatively simple concept, but execution of that is not as easy. There's some engineering problems associated and those machines had to hold very, very tight tolerances. And so there's, that's sort of where you've heard uh, some of the stuff about uh, the, the surface bombing maybe to try to disrupt the process of the centrifuges if they're spinning and there's a lot of seismic activity created by aerial bombardment. That can do damage to an operation. But really... Once you have the technology and you have it rigged, depending on how much time you want to spend and how much energy you want to burn and money you want to expend to make it happen, you really only need time to continuously refine that uranium to get it enriched up to weapons grade if you want to. So you could definitely use a uh, what we would call a commercial enrichment facility to produce weapons-grade uranium if you had infinite amounts of time. Generally speaking, though, these would be considerably larger operations to be able to, at least in a timely manner over the course of years, be able to obtain the fissile material required for an actual weapons program. Now, I mentioned the th- the 3 to 5% and the 90% number. However, those are today's standards for uranium enrichment. That's where we say today that's a nuclear weapon. Okay. So there's a couple numbers all over the place. You've heard 60% in some places. I've heard 70% in some places. But there was one report that came out that said that the Iranians had enriched to 83.7%. Now, here's the thing about that. The bomb that we dropped on Hiroshima 
uh, little man, it was little, little boy, sorry, little boy, excuse me, little boy was 80%. And it was kind of a dirty bomb. We didn't really know what we were doing at the time. So the Iranians had already exceeded the enrichment capability to produce a dirty bomb. Do they really care? I don't know. The premise of the whole situation is this. Generally speaking, an acceptable enrichment number is 20. Because of the way the things are rigged up, you basically spin it and whatever you get out of your your process, and then you can back cut that a little bit to be able to make your nuclear fuel. Like the nuclear fuel doesn't, roll out of the centrifuges ready to rock. It's not like solid uranium at 3 and 5%. No. They produce it to a particular grade, and then they can back cut it to produce whatever nuclear fuel that particular reactor wants to run on. Right? So 20% is the number. However, after you get above that, that 20% number, you are talking about severe diminishing returns. To, I mean, the amount of energy, time, uh, money, because you got to pay the people to run the facility. You got to have the electricity to spin the centrifuges. You know, you have to have the facility itself, like the the transport capabilities, the 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 production of the actual fuel capability, like exceptionally expensive to go any higher than twenty percent. So, regardless of what number you go for, there's only really one reason that you go any higher than 20%. So even though the Iranians are saying, no, we're not making a bomb. No, we're not doing this. We're just, we're, we're just keeping our, you know, capabilities, you know, et cetera, et cetera. That is just simply not how it works. You don't refine up to, well, let's, just, let's accept 60. You don't enrich up to 60 and then back cut. Like that's an absolute waste of money. Like you, you, you do not do that. So when it comes to the actual mechanism of making a nuclear warhead, it's actually not all that complicated to get a low energy neutron to strike a, a, a nucleus, especially by today's standards. Like when we're talking about being able to get it done in like the 1940s or whatever, a little bit more complicated today, uh, really simple stuff to do. And the information on how to do that is pretty much readily available at this point in time. So the threshold for having such a catastrophic uh, nuclear capability is really the ability to refine it to the weapons grade uranium level. Now with somebody who considers himself pretty anti-war, especially in the current posture that we're in where Congress does not do the declaration of war stuff, right? Whether you agree with the ability of the president to act unilaterally like in this instance or not, whether you agree with the National Defense Authorization Act, the Patriot Act, et cetera, et cetera, whether those should be continued to be a thing, I think that we can all agree that genocidal maniacs with hypersonic missiles should not have nuclear weapons. And there's no other reason to enrich, particularly <laughs> in a underground enrichment facility specifically designed to shield it from only the most sophisticated airstrikes, uranium enrichment above, well above any kind of commercial threshold.